So the title of the talk is From Pitch to Prototype and Who Are You Designing for Anyway? So the first question, hopefully you can see this, what do robotics, autonomous vehicles, mobile apps, big data, uh, that's a good start, what do those all have, to have in common? What do they have? Pardon? And I'm, all I'm hearing is blah, 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 blah. Somebody, nice and clear. Buzzwords. Buzzwords. OK. How about something else? <laughs> How about who are you designing for? What clue might that give you? They have people in them, right? There's systems, and they have people in them. So even if it's something that's an autonomous vehicle, somebody has to build it, start it, stop it, repair it. So we want you, through this, this brief talk, to start thinking a little more broadly about who your design is going to be impacting and who the potential users are. So we're going to show you a couple techniques. So who am I, besides Chris introduced me as Professor McGregor, um, and I'm the, in Department of Systems Design Engineering. I'm currently our Associate Chair undergrad, um, but I'm also the Director of the Usability and Interactive Technology Lab, and on the right of those slides are some of the things that I do. I've been working in the area of human factors engineering for over 30 years. Uh, I've got a blend of psychology and industrial engineering degrees. And the new kind of hobby that I've picked up, if we'll call it that, oh, Wayne's not here. Where'd Wayne go? Does everybody know Wayne Cheng? Yep, Conrad? So he's roped me into doing some pitch contests and, and some other things like that. So that's the other kind of uh, interesting little side hobby I've picked up. Not me doing the pitches, me actually being on the panel that is deciding whether you are going to get money, right? Okay, so why are you really here? Why are you here right now? Food, food. okay. Besides food, why else? To learn. to learn, to get some ideas for your capstone. How many have got their capstone project finished? Really? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Okay, so the whole thing is you're not, and the goal of this type of an event is really to get you thinking about the kinds of things that will help you be on a good, positive, successful track, because when you do your things at Symposium and when you apply for the ESH Awards, we want to see awesomeness, right? We want to see really great projects, and so the starting point is here. So one of the things we'd like to do is get you to think a little bit differently and go beyond the obvious, because the obvious has us being kind of lazy. So on the next slide, I want you to first ask yourself, what do you see first? I will be reminding you of these questions. What is the system that is being represented in the picture? And who could be the users in the system? So we're just going to use this as a little practice, OK? All right, everybody ready for the slide? All right, everybody see? I will stay, stand out of the way, hopefully. OK. <laughs> so what do you see first? What do you see first? A blown up motorcycle. A blown up motorcycle? That's what you saw first? What did somebody else see first? What's the first thing you saw? Yep. Orange. Orange, OK. So the color orange stood out for you. What else? I saw the motorcycle. The motorcycle wheel first. Anything else? Yeah. Helmet first. Yeah, I'm a rider, so I, always, I I picked up the helmet first. Anybody else riders? No, me, just me, just me. Pardon me. Is it a trick question? Oh, okay. All right. Um, what is the system? Not quite sure what he was getting at, but all right. What is the system? What is it? Transportation. Transportation? That's a, it links into the bigger transportation? It's actually an easier answer than, than that, but that's good because we're going in that direction. What's the system? Motorcycle. It's a motorcycle. Motorcycle with a rider. So who could be the users in the system? The rider's a pretty obvious one, but who else? Mechanics. Yeah, mechanics. Sponsors? <coughs> Who are the stakeholders? Who are the stakeholders in the design of this system? Customer. 
Customer? Anything else? Say sponsors again. You can say sponsors again. Sure, they're stakeholders. The riders are stakeholders. Manufacturers. Manufacturers. Okay, so you're getting the idea. So one of the things that we're finding, especially in pitch contests, not to steal Wayne's thunder, is that often what the group will tell us is about the primary users. They'll tell us about the really obvious. But they haven't actually thought about the less obvious. So who else might have to touch or use that system? So we've heard a couple of things like the mechanics, right? And then there's the less obvious, and that's the tertiary users. Who are the other participants in the larger system? So somebody mentioned transportation, right? So now let's go through it again. So now that I've kind of primed your brain. So who are the primary users? Who are to be the people that actually kind of do the first touch on this? Yeah, the rider. We'll start there. That's good. How about less obvious? Somebody mentioned mechanics. What about the person who assembled it? Yep, the person who's doing the assembly in the first place. How about tertiary users? Larger system. Yeah, other people sharing the road. People sleeping next, next to a racetrack, okay. Yeah, they're sharing the environment in some way, shape, or form. Anything else? Yes. Yep, suppliers of parts and materials, that's excellent. The retailers. So if, before I go to the next slide, if for your own project, the farthest you got was just the obvious, you need to be rethinking it. Because your design has to, you have to know that it's going to be touched by other people. So primary users, we said the rider and the mechanic. Secondary users, manufacturing parts, assemblers and testers, sales reps. Um, tertiary users, pedestrians, other drivers, traffic standards and regulations. That's often one that people will forget until we prompt them and say, so have you actually checked the standards on whatever it is you're designing? Um, what's the government uh, stakeholder in this? Um, the engineering design team, the CEO and shareholders of the motorcycle company, the designers of peripheral devices and accessories. Okay, we've got some ideas that this is what you're, you're doing, thinking a little more broadly. So I have actually added in a question because if you want to go forward to Ash, and again, not stealing Wayne's thunder, um, where do the investors fit in? Mom and dad are paying for your capstone. Where do they fit in? Anybody? Want to take a crack at it? Yeah. Primary. Pardon? Primary. Are the investors primary users? They fund everything. So are they primary users? If they're a rider, they are, right? And some investors will invest in things because they've got a, a personal interest. Often our investors are down here, um, but they'll have very, they may have very particular opinions about um, how something should be, and that's, it's, it's important that the design team recognize who else they're affecting and that it's not just a conversation with the investor, it's also the conversations with these other participants. Um, so that was a, a, a bullseye. Another way you can do it is a radial map. Um, so how many have actually done a stakeholder map for their project? Oh, an easy activity for you to do if you haven't done it. Um, so that you're pushing yourself to think, like, what else are we missing? Right? That's, that's the big thing. What else are we missing? So, um, yes, I like this cartoon. So it says, each user in the system is going to have a different perspective. That same goes with stakeholders. Your investor is going to have a different, likely to have a different opinion, a different perspective than your primary user, who's going to have a different perspective than your secondary users or your tertiary users. But you've got a responsibility to all of them. So how do you get them on the same page? Anybody know? Oh, 
okay, I will reveal it. <laughs> okay. So this may seem lame, um, but I was just at uh, the conference. There's a conference called Flexible, F-L-U-X-I-B-L-E, that was just held uh, in uh, Waterloo this weekend, which brings in practitioners from across Canada, the US, um, and they're designers who have to think really broadly. Um, and it's not just about mobile apps, and it's not just about digital. Um, and it's also about how are we affecting experience through our design. So if you want to consider the stakeholders, you also have to consider that they're human. And so you want to be thinking as broadly about that as well. How many have read The Design of Everyday Things? Other than systems people. <laughs> so if you haven't, this is a great starting point. So this is Donald Norman's book. It was originally written in 1989, or at least that was the first release that I saw, and it was called The Psychology of Everyday Things. And it didn't sell to engineers. Why? Because it had the word psychology in it. And as soon as he changed it to The Design of Everyday Things, it actually opened up the door for designers to really be thinking about this. Now, if you don't know Donald Norman, he actually spent quite a bit of time with Apple as well. And he's one of the lead consultants on user-centered design, kind of the, um, a, a notary in the, in the field with Jacob Nielsen, which you, probably doesn't mean anything to you, but it means a lot to people that work in, really work in the user experience end of things. So something like a motorcycle has a lot of interaction points. Potential interactions with pedestrians, potential interactions with other, um, other vehicles, potential interactions with licensing, all those kinds of things, right? So, so we, again, the better pitches, the better products, the ones more likely to launch, even if they don't, haven't mastered this, they're at least thinking about it. And how do you go about thinking about it? So there's another book that I like by Scott Herf called The Designing Products People Love. And a successful product start with observing what real people do, not what you think they do. So how many have gone out and already talked to stakeholders? Okay, guess what should be on your bucket list for your projects? And how do you go about doing that? Well, that can be a bit intimidating. And since I don't have time to teach the entire course in 15 minutes, um, although I, too bad, next time I'll think to do it. Um, at this flexible conference I was at, an educator um, did a blues rendition and sang through 100 methods in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> that was a bar I'm not willing to try and tackle right now. Okay, but the bigger thing is think about your stakeholders, then think about how you're gonna go about talking to them. How are you gonna to start to learn more about them? And in the field I'm in, user-centered design, human factors engineering, UX, We've got multiple ways of doing it, and some of them are really short and relatively easy. You don't have to have a master's degree to be able to do these. So the one up here, if you can see where I'm waving at, that's a user journey map, just an example of a user journey map, where you can start to map out and try and figure out where the pain points or the current pain points are in the process for your, your various stakeholders. And then you have a nice little conversation with them about, okay, what, why is this really bugging you? What's really happening there? Um, another one you can do is actually do simulation exercises so that you're actually trying your best to put yourself into the position of the person or the persons, the various people that will actually be doing things. And we've had uh, um, lots of success with that actually with simulation um, because the simulation helps with empathy. And then these are representatives of um, various personas that we'll do to try and, again, better understand how might somebody actually interact with this project, this product, even though we don't have them physically there. And even if it's a component, right? Somebody's got to handle it. Somebody's got to do something with it. What is that? What does that mean for them? How do they work with that? Um, I, my son-in-law is a millwright, and he will tell you the number of times that people that are designing components who do not think about the people that actually have to do installs 
drives them crazy. So you want to be thinking about that. Somebody else is going to, if it gets launched, is going to be using that and working with it. And then finally, there's just observation. And we have technique that we call risk reconnaissance observation, where you can, if you don't know a lot about your, your um, potential stakeholders, you can start to, you can snoop them <laughs> on the internet. So what's your project? Okay, so vehicle signaling. So what might be a way that we might kind of snoop vehicle signaling? Yeah, you can, you, you, can, um, you can look at blogs. You know the Transport Canada, or the MTO um, high tower stuff that is showing the traffic? You could be watching to see is anybody actually doing signals when they're changing lanes? Right? There's lots of ways to, you can, you can. There's lots of ways of being a little more creative about how am I actually gonna learn about this? And so that's the other piece with design and why I love UX so much is because we have infinite creativity for being snooping into other people's things, right? So reconnaissance missions. So, and I said this was pitch to prototype, so this is a little bit of a pitch for my course. Um, and I wanted to use this because when I gave this talk last year, one of the mechatronics students actually took 348, which is the user-centered design course I teach as a technical elective um, in, the, uh, in the winter term. And can most of you read what it is? So this, these are actually his words. And I know what stands out for me but what kind of things stand out for you? It's a little bit lengthy, but you've got time to read it. It's kind of small. What stands out for you? Anything? Can you not read it? It's pretty... Yeah? Uh, the second bolded part. Which one? Uh, the second one they asked was... What I, why I wanted to waste my time? I love that, right? So the... He works with his team, he's all gung-ho, um, and he goes to try and do some of these methods, because they're actually built a, a design portfolio in my course. And, um, and his team says, the second question is, why do you want to waste your time? And the first question is, what is user-centered design? So if you don't know the answer to that, I'm happy to stick around and I can explain that in more detail. But understanding your users is important. Um, but he also then, like, and he wrote this to me, and he, and he let me know which, which methods really stood out for him, and he knew nothing. So the bottom line that says, I came into this course with no user research skills, and I'm leaving with a whole new skill set, that's what we wanted you to start to get out of this kind of um, edge con, is what are the skill sets that you need to be picking up? What have you kind of dropped along the way? Could, and it doesn't have to be everybody on the team, but could somebody on the team start taking responsibility for some of this? Because what I'd really like to do when we see, when we see you at, at the Norman Ash is that we're hearing awesome pitches that are grounded in evidence, you've, and you've done your due diligence. Not, well, now I gotta make it up on the fly because we didn't actually do something, because we, we can catch that. So the time to be thinking about this is now. We want you to have awesome projects at your symposium. And if you, even if you don't want to take 348, because I'm not really expecting people to take 348, but if you're looking for some advice, come and see us. Okay? And on that note, I will actually finish early. Is that okay? Yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. Oh, you got a question? Yeah. Oh, role play? So, excellent question. So we do simulation exercises. So we're, oh, give you an example. Um, if you're designing a video game for children with some sort of disability, it's really hard to get access to the children themselves. So there's ways that you can actually mock it up so that you put weights on, you try and simulate as much as possible the kind of, oh, you do like Jake did, 
and you, have a, you might have a brace on your leg, right? And you actually try to feel what it is they're feeling. So you're role playing through it. And so that you, then you're noting where the pain points are. But excellent question. Any others? I know you're going to kind of dovetail into the customer experience stuff. So there, I just set you up. <laughs>